Bujati Gamadoa, and welcome to the fourth History of University of Life seminar for 2020. My name is Matthew Thomas, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Sydney School of Education and Social Work here at the University of Sydney, and my research areas are comparative education and sociology of education. Along with Julia Horn and Derek Schroeder, I'm also a co-convener of the History of University of Life seminar series for 2020. We'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and it is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built and when, where we are recording from today. So as we share our knowledge and research practices together, may we forever remember the uh, Aboriginal custodianship of country and the knowledge embedded within country. We also pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and to any First Nations people who are viewing today's seminar. Quote, Australia has one of the best higher education systems in the world. That is a national treasure that we should be supporting. These words were spoken by Dr. Michael Spence, Vice Chancellor and Principal here at the University of Sydney, just a few weeks ago at the Senate Committee hearing for the Job Ready Graduates Bill, which we now know passed both houses of parliament late last week. This reform alters several aspects of higher education funding uh, in Australia and will have direct effects on both students and universities. Yet, there is considerable doubt whether the reform will achieve its stated goals of producing more job-ready graduates, particularly in STEM fields and other related fields that are deemed a high priority. There is little doubt, however, that it will disproportionately impact female and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students who are generally more likely to enroll in arts and social sciences subjects. There may be other un unintended consequences as well related to teaching quality, the teacher-student ratio, um, research funding, and employment of academics, perhaps among others. In short, and to return to Michael Spence's testimony from the Senate hearing, quote, this bill is riddled with perverse effects. Today's seminar then focuses on the issue of higher education policy reform and asks, where to now? In recent weeks, we've seen the narrow passing of a controversial reform in Australia, but this was not the first reform in Australia, nor will it be the last. And of course, Australia is not the only country to experience higher education reforms. Thus, in today's session, we want to reflect on and broadly consider the promises, perils, and purposes of higher education reforms. What is higher education for? How should it function and be funded? And should we reconsider its role and relationship to society? These are incredibly large questions, of course, and we will not be able to adequately answer all of them today, or even to consider all of the consequences, intended or otherwise, of higher education reform policies. Yet our intent is to ignite a deeper conversation about reform and the related goals that we are striving to accomplish through them. We are delighted today to be joined by three higher education experts, each of whom will bring us a unique but complementary perspective on higher education reform. In the studio with me today are Associate Professor Tamson Peach from the University of Technology, Sydney, and our very own Leo Renhao Shu from the University of Sydney. Professor Glenn Davis of Australia National University will be joining us via Zoom. And we'll have the privilege of hearing a short paper presentation from each of them after which we'll have a brief period of Q&A where we invite you to ask your questions. So as you're following along at home or at work, wherever you are, uh, perhaps petting your cat or maybe doing some lunges or toe, toe touches uh, while you listen, we encourage to, you to jot down your questions and save them for later uh, so that our panelists can address as many of them as possible during the Q&A. Uh, please feel free to put those questions in the Q&A chat box at any time during today's seminar. And for those of you who are on Twitter, we encourage you to tweet at us at H-U-L Seminar, Hall Seminar, and you can also find all three of today's presenters on Twitter as well. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Glenn Davis, who is a distinguished professor of political science at the, National Austra excuse me, at the Australian National University and chief executive officer of the Paul Ramsey Foundation, Australia's largest philanthropic endowment. Professor Davis served previously as vice chancellor of the University of Melbourne from 2005 to 2018, and he is the author of the book, The Australian Idea of a University. 
We will now hear Professor Davis's presentation, which focuses on the history of the Liberal Party and its changing ideas about higher education reform. Glenn recorded this presentation just days before the passing of the Job Ready Graduates Bill, following conversations with myself and Julia in early October. We'll now turn it over to Glenn's presentation. Thank you for the invitation to say a few words about higher education reform. I hope to speculate about why coherent policy remains elusive. Given the government of the day, this inevitably touches on the character of the Liberal Party in office. There is, of course, much worth exploring also about labour in universities. But since the Liberals and their predecessors have held government for nearly 60 of the past 90 years, no party has enjoyed more opportunity to shape higher education and the important role of universities in original liberal thinking should not be forgotten. Liberal Party founder Robert Gordon Menzies saw universities as central to a successful democracy. Indeed, as he put it in many speeches, higher education is the key to a good life, to citizenship, to civilization. The stakes don't get much higher. When he left politics, Menzies accepted only one public office as chancellor of a university. He considered the expansion of higher education as his most significant contribution to public life. As Prime Minister, Menzies made clear that a degree, a university degree, is about more than earning a living. It's about developing a philosophy for living, a capacity for sustained reflection. So how did the Liberal Party go from a view of the humanities as central to democracy to an education minister who proposes to lift the cost of an arts degree by 113%. Announcing his legislation, Education Minister Dan Tian offered an unapologetically utilitarian rationale for public universities. They train Australians for employment. And if universities do research, it should be industry friendly. Clearly something important has changed in the liberal view of universities. A simple explanation might just stress changes in the national life. This was the case put by John Howard in 1996 when he delivered a speech in honour of Sir Robert called the Liberal Tradition. His party, said the newly elected Prime Minister Howard, does not follow a fixed ideology, but quote, a political philosophy with values that need to be related to the great issues of the day and of the future. In this survey of what John Howard called liberalism's enduring values, there was no mention at all of education. So why do liberal education ministers keep evoking Menzies as the gold standard? Perhaps because they struggle to find a new narrative. For universities represent a challenge of political and fiscal management for which familiar liberal rhetoric about freedom, choice and competition provides little guidance. Indeed, liberal parliamentarians criticise universities for being too market focused. So here is the challenge of incumbencies. Liberal ministers have become managers of a system they did not invent and remain unclear how to change. Interestingly, Menzies foresaw the dilemma. University education is a good thing, he declared in a speech to parliament in 1963, but it's very expensive enrol too many students and the cost will become prohibitive. Yet demand for university places continued to grow and eventually, 20 years after Menzies retired, determined to make higher education more accessible across Australia, Labor Minister John Dawkins embraced the full service research-based model of higher education. He invented what he called a unified national system, a single legislated model for an Australian university. And he dealt with the additional cost by pushing funding responsibility back onto students. In opposition, the Liberals opposed the Dawkins changes and their 1993 election manifesto, Fight Back, promised explicitly to end the unified national system. Yet the transformation of higher education was largely complete by the time the coalition regained office in 1996. How then would the Liberals deal with the very different tertiary system they had opposed, but now inherited? The answer is simple, if perhaps unexpected. After 30 years and seven Liberal ministers of education, the Dawkins system remains largely intact. 
for a Liberal Party which celebrates markets and competition, which speaks of innovation and the valuing of institutional diversity, this approach should be anathema. Higher education remains a command and control economy run from Canberra. Domestic undergraduate load is decided by a minister who also sets prices. Even former Minister Dawkins has called for an end to this level of intervention. Yet the TN package before the Senate once again just tweaks the inherited policy framework. Because the politics of reform are difficult, Minister TN has followed the path of least resistance minimise cost of government without opening up larger issues. He will pay for new places on campus by cutting funds from existing programs and he'll deal with political imperative by shifting money to the regions. It's very hard to see much here that meets professed liberal values. Now, some liberal ministers did propose changes, notably David Kemp and Christopher Pine. Both came to political grief and their proposals were abandoned. And this failure to reform financing of education leaves Australia's public universities in an invidious position, frequently censored by government for sins, real or imagined, but unable to carve out an independent future given government controls. Meanwhile, universities must operate with what is manifestly inadequate domestic funding. For some years, international students kept our public universities financially afloat, but this has been shattered by COVID-19. While casinos found support from Canberra through the pandemic, public universities were expressly excluded from support such as the JobKeeper scheme. And the result is a decimation of higher education without precedent. Such an emergency calls for bold thinking, yet the TN package makes no acknowledgement of the dilemma, nor offers any relief from the constraints of centralised higher education policy. A contributor to The Australian of all places labelled the result, and I quote, a masterclass in bad public policy. Framing higher education is never simple. Finding ways to meet the multiple and sometimes contradictory objectives of a large system, of course, is a significant design challenge. But then it's not clear what principles might guide Mr. Tien's thinking. The Liberal Party issued no policy statement on higher education during any of the past three federal election campaigns. This silence is puzzling for a party that aspires to government. New high wage jobs require tertiary training. Research will become ever more important to sustained advanced manufacturing. A knowledge economy needs, well, knowledge. So a liberal view of higher education should embrace more than fiddling course costs or clumsy efforts at labor market planning. It should talk about purpose, about investment in every Australian to live the life they value. Liberals could draw on recent independent reports about a more principles-based higher education system. There are numerous ideas circulating about a post dawkins tertiary world, suggestions from within the sector and beyond about ways to put students at the centre of policy, to encourage institutional differentiation, to link universities more closely to community, to reward differences in mission and delivery and curriculum. Ideally, we can find consensus around a higher education system that opens participation widely, that encourages diversity, that respects institutional autonomy, that pays what it takes, and that asks the minister to set system goals rather than serve as a micro-regulator. Much of this could be secured by a commitment to good policy making through consultation. It's telling that the few sustained reforms of the system since 1989 followed substantive public deliberation. Brendan Nelson on research funding in 2003 and Julia Gillard on the demand driven system in 2009. By contrast, the conspicuous policy failures, Kemp in 1999 Pine in 2014 and perhaps Teen in 2020, each saw a minister announce major public amendments without first seeking a mandate or making a case in public. Former Liberal advisor Andrew Norton has observed that while Robert Menzies was deeply engaged with universities, his successes rarely shared his interest. Tertiary policy is not an issue, says Norton, that has become deeply embedded in the culture of the party. 
The higher education portfolio is neither highly sought after by ambitious ministers, nor seen as strategic by the party leadership. And the result is disjointed policy choices and poorly designed packages. Somewhere on the journey from Menzies to Teen, it seems liberal thinking about higher education went missing. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Davis, for this uh, wonderfully rich presentation, which I think so perfectly illustrates the value of taking a historical perspective to the study of education. Um, I'm sure many of our, our viewers at home have a number of questions. I, I do as well. So I'm wondering if, if you can enlighten us what, uh, what you make of this bill's recent passing, and perhaps beyond that, um, if you can theorize or explain why, why we keep going through the similar policy debates uh, over and over again. Are, are there structural barriers to reforms that go beyond just tweaks, as you mentioned in your presentation? Thanks, Matthew. And first, can I just say I'm honoured to join you in, in acknowledging the Gadigal people on whose land the University of Sydney is, is constructed. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this great seminar series that uh, the team has organised. As you noted, the recording was made before the TN bill went to the Senate. I didn't know then whether it would pass or not. It passed by one, so it was the nearest possible thing. Uh, I don't think it really changes the analysis, and nor does it change, I think, the judgment that Michael Spence offered. This is a, a bill full of perverse effects. I tried to, at, toward the close, suggest why I think, like the Verbons, we, we forget nothing and we learn nothing. Uh, it's because we don't have processes. Uh, if you stand up in the National Press Club and just announce the set of changes for which you've done no serious work and no work in public, whatever you did in private, uh, how, can, how can you be confident that in an area as complex and structurally difficult as higher education, you've got a clue of what will work? And so what you do is what's worked in the past. You pick up the instruments that the Department of Education has developed for you over decades and you just you know, fiddle them and clumsily reinsert them and that's what we've done again. So you know, we can talk about the detail of the TN package but the remarkable thing for me is that it's just more of the same. It's just attempting to fund more students into the system without putting any more money into it and the perverse things that Michael Spence has talked about arise from that. Mm. Thank you so much, and uh, we hope you will stick with us and uh, be available for some questions that might come up at the end. Um, I think it's, it's, it's particularly uh, fitting that you address the, the principles that are guiding reform because that's one of the through lines of today's presentation uh, that cuts across uh, your presentation as well as the next two that are coming up. Um, and it's now my privilege to uh, turn to our next presenter, Leo Renhao Shu who is a PhD candidate in education here at the University of Sydney. His research examines how governments have allocated university places to students, and in particular, compares higher education enrollment policies in Australia and Taiwan. Prior to his PhD candidature here at the University of Sydney, Leo was an administrator of the Department of Education at the Taipei City Government, engaged in facilitating the 12-year basic education reform, uh, Leo, thank you so much for joining us, and we very much forward to look forward to hearing your perspective on higher education reforms in Taiwan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leo. And first of, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that I pay my deepest respect to the earliest of this land past, present, and emerging. I'm also committed to being mindful of the history of this land in all my undertakings here and also to listening deeply to the voice of First Nations people. So today, I will share two things. First, two historical higher education reforms in Taiwan. One, push the system into massification. And second, the policy aimed to address the low birth rate and overdevelopment of higher education institutions in Taiwan, which means um, the second one I want to uh, share is about how the policy misalignment influenced the higher education system in Taiwan. It means the loose connection between policy goals, approach, as well as the societal change could produce the undesired consequence that the government sometimes need to pay much effort to resolve, this, uh, to resolve the problems. So first, I want to highlight some of the similarities and the difference between 
Taiwan's and Australia's higher education systems. In terms of the population and domestic student enrollment, these two cases have very similar size that the overall population is 23 million in Taiwan and 24 million in Australia. And for domestic student enrollment, it is 1.01 .01 in Taiwan and 1.08 in Australia. However, the number of higher education institutions in Taiwan is much more than Australia. There are currently 125 universities, whereas there are only 43 universities in Australia, which means the average number of student enrollment in a single university in Australia is generally higher than Taiwanese university. And here I want to show you the first slide. The first slide, I want to show you another difference. If you look at the institutional level, the proportion of public and the private university in Taiwan, you can easily see the majority is private sector. They are only 30% are public universities. So how such landscape established? We probably can find some clues from each change in student enrollment since the 1950s. So from the second slide, I mark two turning points here. The first one, we can see a sharp increase in student participation since the early 1990s. It was in part caused by the 1994 civic education reform that I named as Reform 1. And later, the enrollment growth became steadily and even turned to decrease after 2010. It was government restrictions on university places since the 2008 to response to the demographic change and I named as Reform 2. Slide 3, I want to briefly introduce the Reform 1. The Reform 1 was a bottom-up policy change in Taiwan that the government responds to the social movement's appeals. In the early 90s, people urged the government provide more university opportunity for the students and they organized the protest to gain the public support. As a result, the government upgraded many colleges to the university level. And also, of course, the government established few public universities. This government action pushed the higher education system towards massification. From this chart, you can see it brought a radical change that number of universities increased from 23 to 75 only 10 years after Reform 1. From next slide, it shows the higher education privatization happened along with this expansion. Only 30% public universities were built or upgraded after Reform 1. But look, more than 70% private universities emerged post-1994. Here, it gives an important message that, indeed, more and more students were able to access universities However, mostly enrolled in private sector. The next slide, I want to introduce about Reform 2. In Taiwan, the demographic condition has been another crucial issue to the higher education development in Taiwan. The birth rate in Taiwan continued to decrease. From this chart, if we look at 18-year-old population example, because they are the main cohort to enroll in university, you can see the population dropped from 300 to 96,000 in 1994 to 249,000 in 2020. The government even predict the decreasing trend will continue to only 200,000 in 2030. Here, it gets the consequence of the Reform 1 an entirely different meaning that the university are facing the severe student shortage, especially the private sector. As a result, the government launched restrictions on university places, as I mentioned. Three regulations took place. The first one, the government camp on student places, which means all the university could not, I mean, they are not allowed to increase student places because there are no more new, I mean, more and more students population. Second, the government reduced the mandate student to teacher ratio to limit it the increase in student enrollment <coughs> and ensure university quality. In Taiwan, all the universities need to follow the table established by the government. One of the criteria is 
student to teacher ratio. So here, university only have two options. One, they need to hire more academic staff, or B, then second, they need to uh, reduce the student places. And third, the government introduced a performance-based regulation where the student enrollment rate is not allowed to fall below 80% compared with previous year, more than two academic years, which means uh, student enrollment become a check, I mean become a, a number for government to check uh, university places. And all the universities need to work hard to recruit students. Otherwise, the government will think about, oh, you have a very bad performance. And the government will, uh, all the, I mean, uh, otherwise the university for free, the given student places from the government. And the final side, I summarize the change in student enrollment within public and the private university over Reform 1 and 2. Before Reform 1, it is true, only some economically and politically privileged groups were able to attend university in Taiwan. But if you look at the chart, you can see at least 30% students study in public sector. It is also true that Reform 1 profoundly widened university access. However, I argue here, the means adopted by the government also push the system into a privatizing process. And if we look at Reform 2, although Reform 2 was aimed to deal with the demographic decrease, it is to some extent caused the increase in student enrollment of public sector because the government did camp the growth in student places, but the government did not cut the public funding to support public and the private university to, to provide uh, student places. So under the decreasing trend of student uh, population, it become less competitive for students to be admitted into public sector. And of course, I want to say the higher education system of Taiwan and Australia are very different from each other. And I don't think the practice can be directly transferred, but here an implication from Taiwan experience is worth thinking, especially the Australian government just passed a new bill. That is, for the reform itself, it is really important to think about the alignment between policy goals, means, and even broadly the societal changes. Because, as I say, sometimes if we look at Taiwan's case, the government needs to pay more cost, much effort, in addressing the undesired consequence result from the previous reform. It does not mean the previous reform was bad. I think it's some sort of the disconnection among all the policy elements and the government needs to consider the so social change as well. So here, this is the context of Taiwan's higher education reform. And later, I look forward to hear about and also discuss about the Australian higher education reform policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leo, for this uh, amazing presentation. And of course, your visuals are always a uh, remarkable joy to see. Um, and I think it's really interesting the way that you've painted a very clear similarity across the Australian and the Taiwanese system in some ways in terms of the overall national population or the number of domestic students. And yet such remarkable differences in terms of uh, the number of institutions that are private and are public across these two uh, locations. Uh, you and I both conduct research in comparative education and we, we enjoy looking cross-nationally at education systems. So I'm wondering, based on what you've presented about Taiwan, Taiwan's higher education system and also based on your analysis, uh, what lessons are particularly relevant or important uh, when we consider Australia's higher education system? I think for Australian higher education related to the Taiwan's experience, I think one element that I, I think the Australian need to um, consider seriously is about the, the population change. Because um, I think for Australian, especially during COVID-19, the increase in population is, I mean, getting slowly. So I think um, here's experience from Taiwan is because we have uh, um, less and less student population. So many people are thinking about, can we take care of all the students from next generation? 
like, because in Taiwan, we don't have uh, much resources as Australian. So the invaluable resource would be human capital, all the students. So I think it's one of the, um, the experience or one of the um, opinion I will give to the Australian context here. Great, thank you so much. And if you're uh, viewing at home or at work or wherever you are, uh, please uh, start capturing your questions in our Q&A chat box if you have any questions for Glenn or for Leo. We look forward to returning those to those later. Um, it's now my privilege to introduce Tamson Peach, who is an associate professor in social and political sciences at the University of Technology, Sid Sydney, and director of the Australian Center for Public History. Her research focuses on the history and politics of higher education and ideas. Tamson is the author of Empire of Scholars, Universities, Networks, and the British Academic World, and is currently writing a book about the 1926 world cruise of the floating university. I don't know, I would like to be on that, that sounds amazing. Um, as well as leading an ARC project on expertise in interwar Australia. Finally, Tamson is the host of the New Social Contract podcast, uh, which examines how the relationship between universities, the state, and the public might be reshaped under the pressures of both COVID-19 and climate change. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Tamson, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts on this new social contract and what this might entail for higher education. Thank you very much, Matthew, and thank you for having me. And I too acknowledge uh, that we meet on the lands of the Gadigal people. Uh, on which my institution too uh, is based. Now, I've been working um, on the history of universities for over 15 years, nearly 20 years now, which is a, a frightening thing to admit. And one thing that thinking about the long history of universities does is it teaches you that although they are some of the oldest institutions we have, they have only survived because they are dynamic institutions that have adapted and changed. And in fact, those that haven't changed have gone under. Uh, we we, we too, too rarely hear about them. And universities too are no ivory tower. They're deeply connected to politics and to the economy of the places in which they're located and also, of course, to wider global uh, economies and politics. And so, in a way, you can, you can perhaps think of this long history of change and adaption as a kind of social contract that is unlegislated and unstated so it's a kind of agreement really between institutions, the state and the people concerning the distribution of obligations and benefits and consent and purpose that is negotiated and renegotiated in different eras under the pressures of new political and economic conditions, such as war, the ambitions of a monarch, religious rupture, technological change, nationalism, democratic society, the rise of democratic society and also economic imperatives. Of course, the social contract is also a concept in political theory, which has a rich and deep genealogy. And in the last two decades, it's a concept that's been taken up as well by a range of writers on higher education. But political theorists and philosophers and educationists are not the only ones invoking it in 2020. If you've been reading any of the major uh, newspapers, you'll have seen the, contract, uh, the social contract appear, uh, not just on the left, but the Financial Times, that radical publication platform has been running a series uh, uh, invoking the need for a new social contract. The SMH has, it. even Janet Albrechtson in The Australian uh, has invoked the term, as has our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. And when they mobilise it, they do so as a way of arguing for a shift in the existing distribution of obligations and duties, or as a way of seeking to stabilise uh, the current system. So it's clearly a concept to conjure with, and it remains very politically potent in our current moment. So like many of you, I've been thinking about uh, the relationship universities have with the state and society for a while, but when the borders closed at the start of March and it became very clear that universities' business models were going to be significantly uh, disrupted, I began to wonder whether it might be helpful to think about the changes that we are living through now as one of these moments in which the social contract between universities, the state and uh, their various publics is being renegotiated. So how does thinking uh, in terms of a social contract change the way we might think about our situation in the university sector? And what kinds of questions does it enable us to ask that we might not otherwise see? 
Well, first, I think it enables us to look more broadly at the situation we're in. It enables us to look beyond the relentlessness of the rolling news cycle and the ways of redundancies and the necessary but grinding shifts in daily operations. Look beyond these towards the more structural foundations of universities' relationship to society. Indeed, it helps us see, I think, what some of those foundations are. And I'd suggest one of them is the fundamental nature of universities' relationship with the professions. And that, in turn, reminds us where communities of interest of common interest where our allies might be found. And it also enables us to move beyond a position of defend and oppose, towards perhaps an acknowledgement that things do need to change and consideration of the terms on which that change might take place. Now because those terms, at least in the first half of this year, were not yet set, um, and despite the passing of TN's reforms, I'm convinced that they're still not set. And that's because TN's reforms do not effectively engage with the second thing that I think uh, that, that thinking about a social contract enables. And that is a reckoning with the broader societal demands of our time. So what those broader societal demands actually are. Now, COVID and its consequences is obviously one of these, bringing to an end the 30-year era of neoliberal policy and economic consensus uh, that, that we've had. But perhaps even more pressing for our generation and for the generations that follow is climate change and the systems of social and economic extraction that, that drive it. These two processes, and I know some people would love to add in uh, artificial intelligence as well, but I don't know, maybe we can discuss that later. I'm less convinced. I think these two processes are much like war and the ambitions of, of monarchs and, and religious rupture uh, of the past, fundamentally altering the conditions in which human society operates. They are reshaping what communities will want and need and increasingly demand. They are making questions of distribution and access an urgent political imperative. And they are, in short, shifting the terrain on which the social contract is negotiated. And that has massive implications for public institutions like universities. And to my mind, it also presents universities with a huge ob opportunity and indeed an obligation to rethink and reframe the way they understand and express the role and purpose, their role and purpose, and the source of their legitimacy. Now that perhaps sounds a bit vague, so you know, here's another way of putting it. University and uh, uh, expertise and research has been given huge public prominence uh, in the crisis. In fact, my university uh, is apparently receiving six times the number of um, requests from government and from the media for expert comment. And I'm sure the University of Sydney and other universities are the same. But I put it to you that the best technical advice and even government enacting the best technical and medical advice is not what leads to good health outcomes. And you just need to look at the US or the UK to see that. They have excellent uh, medical and technical advice. Two things are much more important, at least in a society like Australia's. And those are, one, a robust, well-supported, universally accessible and trusted health uh, system. And two, the mass consent and participation of the population, of ordinary people. If they withdraw that consent, the whole system falls over. And all government has got is a violence, really, to compel people. So expertise and technical advice has a very important place in meeting the challenges we will face, undeniably. But expertise that is not embedded in society, expertise that understands itself as telling people what they need or offering silver bullet solutions is likely to fail. If those who will never go to university cannot see themselves and their needs in the work that we do inside universities, our legitimacy as public institutions is shot. So as a sector, I think our challenge now, or one of our challenges, because goodness knows there are many, is to understand the implications of this. To learn to speak about it in its various aspects much more explicitly, to forge alliances with those who are and might be our allies, and to develop alternatives and ways of advocating for these changes. Thanks so much, Tam Tamson, and such a timely uh, talk, and I think speaks right to the heart of our focus today on where to now and what's needed in this current situation. Um, 
I mentioned earlier in your introduction that you are the host and probably creator, director, uh, thought leader, provocateur of this podcast, The New Social Contract. Can you comment at all on uh, what ideas emerged through this podcast series that you've been doing the last year and how any of your guests that you featured uh, would feel about some of these ideas that you've raised today concerning this, the new social contract? Thank you, uh, Matthew. I love the idea. Can I put that I'm a provocateur on my, on my academic bio? That'd be great. Um, well, I mean, what it really did was it changed the way we conceived of the discussion we were having. I mean, you know, perhaps you would ordinarily think of um, a, a, a podcast series on, on universities as featuring themes like teaching and learning and, and research and maybe job losses or, or, or student admission, student fees. But instead, we structured the, con uh, the, the conversation around um, in engagements with people who were thinking about the basis of university social license. So there were themes like climate, like the context in which we're operating. Uh, there's a, a whole session on work uh, and relation and the relationship to the world of work. And uh, of course, one on communities as well. Um, and I was particularly struck by, and I've written it down here because because um, it really stayed with me, by something that Lisa Wheelahan um, said in the linked conversation articles that we produced uh, alongside the podcast. Um, and, and that was on, um, uh, that article, in the, the, one, uh, the one that Lisa co-authored was on, on work. And of course, the higher education has a long relationship to work. As I mentioned earlier, Australian universities really are founded, well, they have a foundational relationship with the professions. But Lisa is convinced that higher education cannot and should not um, impart job-ready skills in the way that our minister is hoping it, uh, it, that it, it can and will. Um, and she puts it this way. In, over the, I'm reading it here. Over the last decades or so, the social contract between education and the world of work has shifted from one that emphasises employment or a pathway to a meaningful uh, occupation to one that emphasises employability the attributes that might enable a person to keep and find a job. So students entering university are encouraged to invest in themselves by first anticipating and then acquiring the skills and qualities future employers might want. They bear the risk and the cost of an increasingly uncertain world of work. And I think the, the, the recent reforms just supercharge this um, transfer to the, to the student of the risk of the employment changing employment market. So her framing there of uh, employment as, um, as within a, a changing social contract really helped me see the current debate on skills in a different way. For Lisa, rather than aiming to uh, give students skills, what universities should do, she argues, is equip them with the knowledge they need to be citizens and parents and community members. And for her, occupations is the key category. They need to, universities should equip students with domain knowledge for occupations in which they can grow and develop over the course of their lives. So it's occupations in which there are many kinds of jobs that underpin uh, Lisa's vision. And I think her notion of the changing social contract really helped me see that. Mm, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation in our Q&A, which, which we've just entered. So uh, we've seen a couple, couple of questions coming in. Please feel free to type them in the Q&A box. And we'll try to address as many as possible in the time that we have remaining. It seems like we always run out of time. So I'm going to stop talking and start asking some questions. Um, and the first one is for Leo. Uh, I know you've been researching higher education in Australia and Taiwan uh, for a number of years and also have experience uh, as a student or as a, as a worker in, in some some contexts across those. Um, I'm wondering what has surprised you about higher education in Australia, uh, given your experience and expertise in Taiwan? Oh, good question. Because, <laughs> I mean, as a international student here and study at University of Sydney, University of Sydney is a public university. But what's so called public is really different from what I thought before. Because in Taiwan, as I mentioned, there are more than 30% uh, private. But when I start here as a student, what I feel is about, wow, a public university run like a business. It's totally different from the Taiwanese public university. This is the first Im impression. And the second, I think during the COVID-19, especially uh, for the uh, coalition government just passed a new bill, I found it's really surprised me that the government, in some way, 
um, cut the funding to higher education. And I think it's a, it's a, um, to, to, I mean, as a Taiwanese, I feel like it's a, a cultural shock, I would say. Because in Taiwan, culturally, education is some kind of like a, a, a state's commitment to your population, to all your residents, which means, I think, whether which um, political party run the government, it's really hard to say you're going to cut the funding. You probably you maintain the funding or you shift the funding from, from different education stage. But I've, I don't think it's a acceptable, acceptable reform for Taiwanese that you cut or you make a public sector run like a private um, you know, organization. So it's, I think it's a, a international student that I feel in Australia. It's really different. That's really interesting. Thanks, thanks for sharing uh, your comparative perspective. I, I think we'll stick on this, this idea of comparison. And, and here's a question for Professor Davis. Um, a, a viewer wants to know, are there any exemplar international contexts that provide good lessons for the Australian higher education sector, given its establishment and the way it's structured currently? Thank you, Matthew. And, and yes, I, I appreciate the question uh, and suggested in responding that probably the systems you like are the systems you'd like ours to be like rather than objectively these are, are better systems because as Leo has emphasised, national character matters, tradition matters, the, the structure of the system you inherit matters. Uh, I've got a lot of time for the way uh, British Columbia and Ontario run their systems because in Canada they run at provincial level, not nationally. Um, they invest in them, they're clear about purpose, the mission is well articulated. They're not radically different from our institutions, but they have opportunities and they're often integrated into community in, in particular in interesting ways. Uh, and I personally like the logic of the University of California system, which has again differentiated missions and clarity around that. But um, we're not going to go there in Australia, I suspect, because the complications of federalism and of state legislation are such that we are going to have to work out a settlement that works for us. Uh, and I think um, that we haven't had that public conversation. We, we are very structured by our history. Uh, and uh, you know, Tamsin's talking quite rightly about the shift in, in social contract and the, the permission that underpins it. Um, but in a sense, we don't test it. We're very um, pragmatic, if not utilitarian, about how we value universities uh, and how we think about them. And uh, somebody's in the chat the column has made exactly that point about you go to university, it's just something you do. It's a bit like going to school and then, and then life begins. Uh, and as long as we have that view of institutions, they're not going to frame in a very important way in the national life. We've not been able to make them part of a bigger national conversation. Hmm. Maybe picking up on that idea, a question for, for Tamsin. Um, this idea of the new social contract and, and the public discourse, how can we as the general public uh, around the dinner room table, how can we change the conversation or, or what needs to change in the way that we think about higher education to see more meaningful substantive change take place? Yeah, thank you, um, Matthew, and thank you for the question. If, um, if Glenn, you're saying that higher education is not embedded in the culture of the Liberal Party, I wonder if it's also not necessarily embedded in the way we talk uh, in, in public. And of course, pub there's no such thing as the public. There are lots of publics. And I think that's a helpful way to begin to think through that problem. There are communities of students that are aspiring to enter university and they, they ha have different profiles. There are, is a big community of graduates that university tends to see as their alumni and hit them up for donations, but universities have traditionally been much, much more than that to their graduate bodies. Um, there are the professions who are closely linked to huge numbers of faculties um, with, with really strong disciplinary communities. There is, of course, industry. Uh, there is government, and I could go on. Uh, there are the, the, the locations, the, the locales, the precincts in which universities operate and in regional contexts. Those links are very, very strong. And what would it be, f perhaps, and this is not quite an answer to the question, but what would it be for those groups to have a role 
in the governance structures of, of universities? What would it be for us to embed universities in the societies that they serve? And I think the more we talk about these publics to which, which universities belong, and I must also say universities have a crucial role, and I think this is often missed out when we talk about uh, universities in relationship to the public, in constituting the public. They bring people together and make that space. That has been one of their essential roles as independent and critical institutions in civil society. And that is why Menzies valued them so much. So when we as individuals, but also as institutions and as a sector, talk about universities and their relationship to the public, their value proposition, we have to do so in much more than narrow instrumental individual terms that have largely dominated much university advertising uh, over the last 20 years. Mm. Uh, I think this idea is, is uh, really important for us to consider and, and the way the general public responds and, and values higher education and not just in purely instrumental terms. Um, related to that, there's a, there's a question from somebody, I believe, who comes from the South African university sector who asks, how have employers and the publics, we'll say the general publics in Australia, reacted to this new legislation, the Job Ready Graduates Bill? Um, is there much recognition of the importance of wider, quote unquote, non-market tertiary training, or we might consider uh, non-STEM fields or, or the priority subjects? Um, so for any of the panelists today, in your perception, how have people responded to this new bill being passed? It would appear to be silence, uh, not least it's difficult to get any issue up in the middle of COVID. Um, but more than that, um, the, the professions haven't had a voice in this discussion. Employers, if they've had a voice, we haven't heard it. So it's whatever's happens happened behind doors. And it, I think, so, if you don't mind me, just do a quick uh, segue to terms of, I think, excellent points. One of the issues we haven't confronted in Australia is governance university governance. We have arguments, they're not always great arguments about what we're trying to do here. Um, but until it's part of the problem about how these institutions are constituted, and until we actually get serious about that discussion. I gave a, a presentation once to a group of chancellors pointing out that almost nobody on their councils knew anything about higher education or had any background and tried to compare that and say BHP having a board that had no one who knew anything about mining on it. Uh, and they, that wasn't well received, I can say, with confidence, um, because there's a view that sort of they represent the community and community thinking. But actually, these are huge organisations, as complex as anything in our society. And the idea that you can drop somebody in with sort of community background for a month, uh, once a month, and that they can contribute in a meaningful way is patronising to them, but also deeply ineffective in the way we're trying to run institutions. So we have. I think as a sector, some serious work to do about what does good governance look like. Can I just say one short thing um, in, it sort of jumps off that a little bit, but I think the silence that we have seen more broadly by employer groups and professions and um, e even, even students is really uh, um, telling and we should be listening to that silence and, and wondering what we've done wrong <laughs> as a sector. Yeah, maybe picking up on that idea, and, and, and I think things that all three of our presentations have, have talked about at some point, but this notion of, of universities, particularly in Australia, perhaps, universities as businesses or as corporations. Um, and this, this comes from a question from one of our viewers, but um, I think Leo mentioned that a little bit in his presentation, talking just now in the Q&A about being surprised about the extent to which it felt public or did not feel public. Um, and we've also had a couple of other um, illustrations coming out of that, but how does that hurt or shape the way that we think about what the university is or can be in an Australian context when uh, this idea of universities as corporations is promoted or frequently cited by members across the sector and, and beyond? And this question, I guess, is for anyone who wants to pick it up. Well, I'd love to hear what Glenn has to say, but just, I don't think, um, what is a public institution? It is not just an institution that is publicly funded. There are lots of ways in which public institutions uh, serve uh, the public, and as I said, constitute the public in ways that are detached from the source of their funds. And I think uh, universities are one of those. 
So, you know, we talk a lot about universities as teaching and research institutions, but I think behind that is a mission uh, to be institutions that orient us as a community and as individuals to each other, to the world, to the past and present. And that's expressed in teaching and research. So that is a public good and you can fund that in all sorts of ways. But maybe Glyn. Who's I, I agree with everything you've just said. They're not corporations, but they're expected to manage themselves like they are. And the pressure from the policy setting is to assume that they're gonna behave like corporations and can run with levels of efficiency that, in fact, we, we might not expect to see elsewhere. We have this hybrid model that we've not resolved of what are normally public institutions and in fact raising most of their own income, which is very unlike public universities in the rest of the world, uh, and then held, you know, criticised for, for precisely for doing that. Um, one of the interesting and unhappy things about where we, we are now is we had a set of of uh, politicians who demanded that um, universities not get any support through this crisis because in some way they were guilty of doing something. It wasn't clear what, but they were very much guilty and they shouldn't be funded. And now we're gonna find out what that means because international students, the only plausible source of revenue, and thank you, Leo, for choosing us, uh, is uh, no longer available. And so we, we're about to demonstrate what universities have long argued, that on rates of public funding only, you cannot run an effective institution. And I think that is going to be tragic, or is tragic. Leo, would you like to respond to that as well? Uh, first of all, I want to say <coughs> you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Australia, higher education is still very attractive, of course. And I want to say, uh, maybe related to the previous question, probably I can't answer it about uh, this new Australian policy reform just passed in, in Canberra. But I want to say, Maybe related to the uh, Thompson's about the, the social contract about because in Taiwan, I would say when I look at the job ready graduate package, I think about who say who made the decision about all oh, this discipline, this field, STEM, are the Australians' future. Who said it? And it directly related to the Taiwan experience because in Taiwan it's like annually there's a committee which combined with different governmental bodies. And they will say, oh, for this industry, they may have some you know, like human capital in, like, demand, but some of its more cultural demands, like they may say, oh, we lost some of the uh, researcher or student who exp have been specialized in indigenous studies or design. So, I think it's like a, a, a balanced system to check oh, what kind of university places that the government should found instead of imbalanced into, you know, like to science or to technological or to social science. I think because in the future, we probably have no idea what is the new occupation. It doesn't exist at this pre I mean, present. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like my feeling that when I look at this uh, policy, yeah. Thanks so much, Leo. And I think that's a fabulous note for us to end on when we consider the, the breadth and the depth that university higher education can provide. Uh, and certainly as we consider its value and its purpose uh, in relationship to society. Uh, we sincerely hope that you enjoyed our presentations and discussions today. And as I mentioned earlier, all three of our presenters are on Twitter. So if you'd like to follow up with them individually, I imagine they would be happy to find you in that space. Um, please join me in thanking Glenn, Tamson, and Leo, uh, either by clapping uh, at home or doing some overly demonstrative thing that we all do on Zoom anyway. Uh, it's been a delightful uh, conversation for us to have together today, and we hope that you enjoyed it as well. Um, and we also hope that you're able to uh, join us at our next History of University of Life seminar, which will be on Wednesday, November 11th, previously advertised as November 4th, but November 11th, uh, and we'll focus on managing the current COVID crisis. Also, if you missed one of the first three seminars, they will be available through the link at the slides at the end of today's seminar. And this indeed brings us to our conclusion of the fourth History of University of Life seminar series for 2020. And we hope to see you in November. Thanks so much. <laughs>